Here is an introduction to planet formation to accompany chapter 21 of the textbook Astronomy from OpenStax. So the planet formation process begins with the star formation process. We, we've covered that in Introduction to Star Formation, so I'll assume you've, uh, you've watched that. And so you know then that you have basically a, a young star. There's now hydrogen fusing in the core, or maybe it's just about to be, and this is surrounded by a disk. And this disk is slowly going to cool off, just because you know it was it was hot from all these collisions and hot from collapsing, and the kinetic energy has been released, right? And so it's just going to cool down, just like anything else that's sitting out in space. It'll cool. Um, and so once it gets cool enough, then molecules can actually start to stick together. So when it's hot. Uh, molecules are moving too fast to stick together, or they may stick together, but then they bump into another one and break apart. There's just too many collisions. Once you cool down, they're, they're, these can stick together more easily. There's fewer things to break them apart, and they're, they're going to be maybe bound a little more strongly. So these are going to form dust. And dust, we just mean, you know, something that's a bunch of molecules stuck together that's like a size of a, of a um, micrometer, right? So your hair is about 100 micrometers thick, so you can imagine this is still something very small. And so then these, these dust grains, they can collide and stick together. They can also, uh, they can attract electrostatically. So from colliding, you know, you can build up static electricity, just like when you rub your socks on the carpet. And, you know, as you know, static electricity can cause things to attract. And so these things can collide and stick together or just attract, and they'll form larger chunks of dust. And you can just imagine this thing as being a rock. So it's not a technical term, calling it a rock. Believe it or not, dust is, but rock isn't. Um, so it becomes what you'd call a rock. And then the rocks, these things can collide and um, stick together. Now, if you imagine that, obviously, a lot of times they're going to collide and bounce off. Um, sometimes they're going to collide and even break apart. And so it's a messy, it's a messy process. But some you know, fraction of the time, these things are going to actually stick together. And eventually you can get objects that are around a kilometer or so wide. At that point, gravity is now the main thing holding this together. It's gravitationally bound. Before that, it's, it's um, you know, molecular atomic bonds that, that are the main thing holding together a rock or dust. Once you're at a kilometer, now you're, you're gravitationally bound. We call this thing a planetesimal. And believe it or not, this, um, this is kind of amazing. This image here, this is an actual image of a planetesimal in our solar system. So it may seem unbelievable you can have these big rocks stick together, but I mean, this is obviously what, is, what has happened in this case. So we have our planetesimals. Um, these will undergo further collisions and ultimately they'll, they'll grow in size, right? Again, some may break apart, but occasionally all of them stick together. You'll get bigger and bigger stuff until you get something you'd call a protoplanet. So a protoplanet, this is smaller than, than a big planet like the Earth. Um, that's maybe like a moon-sized object. And what distinguishes this from a planetesimal is it's now large enough that the, the gravitational pressure holding this thing together and the amount of radioactivity that you've collected, because there's just um, you know, radioactive elements made in earlier star formation or earlier uh, stellar evolution, the, that the center of these protoplanets is melted. So it has a molten core, um, just like the Earth, and that allows heavy elements to sink. It's a process we call differentiation, where you, you start out, you know, you have your rock that has all the stuff that's in rocks. You have silicon, magnesium, iron, and when it becomes molten, the, the more dense stuff, like the iron and nickel, is going to sink to the core of this object. So that's a protoplanet, and these collide further to eventually form a planet. And you know the distinction then between a protoplanet and planet is, is basically going to be, um, it's going to come down to our formal definition in the intro to star formation lecture, right? This thing needs to be uh, orbiting the sun. It needs to have cleared its own orbital path. And it needs to be large enough that uh, it's, it's roughly spherical in terms of gravity uh, holding it together. And, you know, then if you have a large enough planet, it can also capture a gas atmosphere. So if we look at our solar system, which we'll talk about more in future lectures, 
but you know you're probably roughly familiar with the Earth is mostly a big old rock. It has a very thin, tiny atmosphere. Jupiter, on the other hand, is called a gas giant. Huge gaseous atmosphere. At the center is actually quite a large, uh, you know, nickel iron core, and that is so large it was able to capture uh, gas, um, so nearby hydrogen, and to form a gas atmosphere. The time scale for this is on the order of a few million years. We can't often directly observe this, so there are, there's more and more planetary observations uh, being made, but there, there are two big problems. One, planets are hard to see, uh, so it's, it, usually we rely on looking at features in the disk, and that tells us about um, what's going on with, with planet formation. And another issue is that because the formation rate is only a few million years, you most of a planet's lifetime is not in this phase. So if you pick any given planet, uh, it's not going to be in the, in the planet formation phase. So there's just a small fraction of objects that are in this, um, in this phase, and so it's hard to study. What we can do is we can look at stars' positions in the HR diagram and roughly determine the age. And, you know, we covered this in the Intro to Star Formation lecture and earlier lectures on Introduction to the HR Diagram. So we can roughly get the age, and we can look at stars of a given age and say, okay, what uh, fraction of these have a disk? And so you can look at the disk fraction. So this is the fraction of uh, stellar systems that have a disk versus the age after formation. And you see it, it decays rapidly, and so... You know, planet formation has to happen within a few million years. That's all you have uh, for it to occur. Now, as far as where the planets are um, located, where they're formed, that depends on uh, the, the properties of the, the planetary material. So the, you know, the material that's condensing to form a planet, it needs to be cool enough that condensation is actually possible. You need to allow the material to kind of condense into a solid object. But the condensation temperatures, this is going to depend on the elements that are involved. Um, so this, what this plot here is showing the abundance of some elements in a um, meteorite on Earth uh, versus the condensation temperature. All you need to pay attention to here is you see these different chemical elements. For instance, you, know, you have bismuth, you have uh, silver, phosphorus, nickel, the condensation temperature depends heavily on what type of element you have. And it depends not only on the element, but it also uh, somewhat obviously depends on the molecules, right? So, for instance, um, you know, you can condense uh, nickel at a very high temperature, but water, you can't, okay? At 1,000 degrees uh, Kelvin, water is just a gas, right? So, obviously, your, your object would have to be much cooler in order to... Um, if you want to have water condense. So the metals, right, these, these can form and condense at much higher temperatures, so closer to a star. And the more complex molecules like water, this is going to have to be formed further from a star. And so your planets that are mostly made of rock, like the Earth, these can form close to your host star. So that's why if you look at the solar system, uh, the inner planets, uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, these are all rocky objects. The, you know, the vast majority of the composition is just a big old rock. The uh, stars and or the planets in the outer solar system, these have large gaseous envelopes. So Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, these, these have these huge gaseous envelopes. And that's because you can only have that gas condense where you're really far away from the host star. And it's cool enough for that gas to condense. And so that's why you have the gas giants out there. And for the so-called ice giants, uh, Uranus and Neptune, where you have methane atmospheres, that actually had to happen even further out from the sun. So methane is extremely volatile. Um, it, it means it's easy to kind of boil uh, compared to, to water. And so this had to happen even uh, further out. And there's a, you know, a rough boundary. It's not exactly a, a sharp line, but it is in this artist's cartoon between where you can have rocky planets and where you have uh, gas giants. And this is referred to as the frost line or the snow line. And so the idea is, you know, the, the stuff like um, uh, 
big hydrogen atmospheres and methane, you know, your methane cannot condense inside this line. Once you get out here, it can. And so that explains the separation between rocky planets and the, the gaseous planets in the solar system. And that's all well and good, but there is a problem. <laughs> so um, we thought that was a nice, great theory for a very long time until in the past couple of decades, exoplanets uh, started to be discovered. And we'll talk more about those in the next lecture. Um, just generally, it's, it's a planet in a different stellar system, so an extrasolar planet or exoplanet. And you can observe these, and when you take a look at the mass of the planet versus the basically the separation between the planet and its host star, you see there are a whole bunch of planets that are the mass of Jupiter are larger, and yet they're closer to their host star than the Earth is to the Sun. So one Earth to Sun distance is one here in the horizontal axis. You have all these objects that are so-called hot Jupiters, because they're you know around the size of Jupiter, but they're very close to the host star, and so they must be quite hot in terms of being irradiated. And um, b because of the properties of these, uh, we'll talk about in the next lecture, these were the easiest to discover. <laughs> so many of the first exoplanets were in this puzzling category that how did, how, that doesn't really fit our planetary formation scheme that we just talked about. Um, so nonetheless, these things exist and they, they have to get this way some, somehow. So what's the, what's the issue? We'll talk about that in a moment. Before that, more problems. Our planetary formation scheme that we had basically says you should have planets um, forming in circular orbits that are roughly in the same plane as the rotation of the, the host star. And the reason is that the, the gas in the disk um, in your early stellar system is going to basically cause friction and it's going to force things to, to orbit in kind of a, a, a roughly circular way. If they're not, then collisions with the disk are going to basically force them into that circular pattern. And similarly, collisions are going to force them to be in roughly the same plane as the, the rotation of the star, um, as we talked about in the introduction to star formation lecture. However, you can look at exoplanets, and we can look at the distribution of exoplanets versus their orbital inclination. So 90 degrees means you're not inclined. That means you'd be in this gray plane. You're rotating, you're orbiting in the same way that the star is rotating. Um, anything deviating from 90, that would be something like this yellow disk here, where you have a relatively high inclination angle in this case. So you, you take a histogram, right? You plot the distribution, the number of exoplanets versus the inclination. Many fit this picture. They're not inclined much, but some are inclined a decent amount. And a handful are inclined a, a whole bunch, right? They're not in the same plane at all. So that doesn't really fit our planetary formation picture. Similarly, you can look at the eccentricity. So eccentricity is a measure of basically how much of an oval uh, a kind of circle-like thing is. So a, a circle has no eccentricity at all. And then as you stretch out that circle, you make it into an ellipse, the eccentricity in, increases. And we can look at the number of exoplanets versus orbital eccentricity here. And most of them fit our normal um, formation picture where things just kind of form with a circular orbit. That circle is enforced by collisions with disk and uh, uh, gas in the disk. But a handful of these are really heavily eccentric. And that doesn't fit the picture. So, okay, so what's going on? We have these two big problems. Is the planetary formation story I told you incorrect? Uh, it's just incomplete. So everything I told you so far about planetary formation is right, but we need to take into account uh, interactions between <clears throat> planets and the early disk, uh, our early gas in the disk, and also especially important are gravitational interactions between planets, especially between the really massive planets in a stellar system. And so for instance, when your massive planet forms early on in the solar system, it drags against the disk, and that can cause your massive planet to move inwards to the, to the host star and give you something like a hot Jupiter. Um, also, what can happen, though, is you have gravitational interactions between the planets, and those can cause planets to move inward or outward, and the details are 
can get pretty complicated. And to be honest, I don't, I don't know them to any great length, so I, I can't tell you exactly how it works. But you do these simulations where you have um, you know, gravitational interactions, and our solar system, for instance, can go from looking like this picture here to something more like uh, the picture we have today. So, you know, initially you have your, your planets, we're just looking at the gas giants here, all at some distance. And as you can see, due to complicated interactions with the, um, with the disk and with uh, just gravitationally with each other, the final orbits can be something uh, completely different. And that is it for this introduction to planet formation for Astronomy 1000.